Hey, hey class, hope everybody's doing all right. Um, let's see, let's see if we can't um, talk a little bit more about chapter 12, which is on violence against women. We're going to work on this, uh, work about, work on the second half of the chapter um, in this lecture. We're going to be talking about um, IPV, intimate partner violence. We're going to be talking about um, dating violence. We're going to be talking about acquaintance rape. We're going to be talking about um, lots of other uh, related issues, um, everything from um, uh, domestic violence to, uh, to battered uh, women's shelters. We're going to be talking about violence that happens for women later in life, maybe elder abuse, maybe widow abuse. And then lastly, at the end of this chapter, um, Crawford talks about different ways that have been successful in terms of making a difference for women with some of these issues. So we'll touch on that as well. All right. Okay, so just really quick and simple outline here. Violence and intimate relationships. Um, that encompasses um, all sorts of things. Um, it we talk about intimate partner violence. We're going to talk about stalking. We're going to talk about unwanted pursuit behaviors, um, cyber stalking. Uh, we'll talk about rape, uh, sexual assault, sexual coercion, acquaintance rape, rape myths, common couples violence, patriarchal terrorism, intimate terrorism, uh, and uh, s battered women's syndrome, battered women's movement, battered women's shelters, and elder abuse. So that's a quick and dirty outline of the terminology or the key terms that we're going to be talking about in this lecture. All right. So intimate partner violence, what is that? Well, intimate partner violence or IPV is physical aggression and violence that occurs within an intimate relationship, right? And this doesn't have to be a married couple. This doesn't have to be, um, uh, you know, a, a formal relationship. This can be just uh, people who are dating, right? Um, but so intimate partner violence occurs in all different sorts of intimate relationships, okay? In general, um, we know sort of from a bigger picture, we know that um, men are more likely to experience violence uh, if we're thinking about violence committed by strangers, whereas women are more likely to experience violence that's committed by people that they know, acquaintances, friends, boyfriends, or husbands. Um, so uh, intimate partner violence is one of those types of violence committed by strangers, I'm sorry, committed by people that um, are known to us. Um, it's violence that occurs um, in an intimate relationship. Okay. One type of intimate partner violence is termed dating violence. Okay. And this is, uh, for example, when you see a couple yelling and screaming at each other and shouting, you know, calling each other names and having a big verbal argument. Well, that's, that's a, um, a loud verbal argument. That's a type of verbal violence. Uh, it's, a, it's a type of dating violence. Okay. Um, this is very common. Um, it can include um, not just verbal uh, violence like yelling, screaming, and name calling. It also can include um, physical violence like shoving, pushing, um, throwing things. Uh, it can actually include uh, hitting as well. Um, dating violence is very pervasive. And U.S. national surveys, 80% um, of college students say that they've been involved in dating violence in some way, um, either uh, yelling and screaming at a partner, hitting a partner. Um, it's very pervasive, and it's not just men. It's not just women. It's uh, all, all different sorts of uh, all, both genders, uh, all different sorts of ethnic groups, all different sorts of um, uh, parts of the country, college, different types of colleges and universities. It's just, a, it's a very, um, very similar rates across all these different groups for, in terms of dating violence. Now, where we see differences in terms of dating violence is we see differences based on motives of men and women for dating violence and also consequences for men and women in terms of dating violence. So let's talk about those two things. 
Okay, so let's look at um, why people are motivated or why people say they're motivated uh, to be aggressive in intimate relationships. And then also let's look at those consequences of that, uh, of that aggression. Um, let's, again, we're talking specifically here about dating violence, okay? So men and women report similar rates of aggress aggression, um, but their motives tend to be different, right? For men, um, staying in the relationship or staying in control of the relationship uh, is what they report as their goal or what happens, what motivates them in terms of their dating violence. Uh, they are most, they're more likely to say that they're, they aggress in order to intimidate and frighten their partner and, and, and control the relationship. Women, however, say that they aggress uh, in self-defense or because uh, they've lost control of themselves and they uh, are aggressive because they're not in control. Uh, for both men and women, the single most predictor of aggressive behavior on their part is having an aggressive partner. So we see basically here that um, aggression begets aggression, right? If, if, if the aggression is there, then there's likely to be a response of aggression, okay? In terms of consequences, we see differences for men and for women. Uh, there are more severe consequences for, men, for women than men. They suffer more fear, they sustain more psychological trauma from dating violence, and they have more serious injuries from dating violence, okay? So uh, differences here on gender uh, in terms of consequences and in terms of motives, all right? All right, so next we're going to talk about stalking. Stalking. Stalking can be defined as repeated unwanted harassing behaviors where the victim feels threatened or fearful uh, by, the, um, by the stalker, okay? Um, approximately 80% of cases of stalking involve... Um, people who were in a relationship, a romantic relationship in the past. So the perpetrator and the victim have a past rom romantic relationship. So you often hear people talk about um, uh, UPBs uh, in terms of stalking. So these are unwanted pursuit behaviors. So um, these are the stalking behaviors uh, when there are these relationship motives present, okay? Um, how, compre how, uh, how um, pervasive is stalking? Well, a, a comprehensive meta-analysis found that 28.6% of women and 13.9% of men have been uh, victims of stalking, um, and that 24% of men have engaged in stalking behavior, and only 12% of women have engaged in stalking behavior. Okay. So if we look at a specific type of stalking, that is cyber stalking, which is um, something that's uh, more recently prevalent. Um, this is repeated, unwanted, and unwelcome pursuit behaviors that take place virtually within the digital environment of the um, internet and using computers and other electronic devices like cell phones. Um, of the people of the most recent survey of cyber stalking, 26% of people surveyed reported that they'd been a victim of cyber stalking. 8% said that they'd been electronically monitored by someone. Um, so this can cause hypervigilance and being in a state of constant stress. Okay, women who have been stalked uh, in this way through cyber stalking um, experience anxiety, depression, suicidal ideation, post-traumatic stress, headaches, or difficulties with sleeping and eating, okay? So stalking can be quite serious in terms of the um, uh, consequences. If we... So we're going to talk about um, sexual coercion and, and acquaintance rape. Um, so rape is always uh, defined as sexual penetration without the person's consent. Um, and it's obtained through either force, threat of harm, or when the person is incapable of giving consent, right? Uh, so that's specific to what rape is. Rape is that sexual penetration uh, without consent uh, 
either obtained through force or threat of harm or when the person is incapable of giving consent, right? Sexual assault or sexual coercion, coercion are terms that are more general. Sexual assault can include rape, um, <clears throat> um, but it, sexual assault and coercion are unwanted sexual contact um, and can be things as simple as um, not rape, but maybe groping or fondling, right? Okay, so according to data from the National Intimate Partner Violence and Sexual Violence Survey, nearly 20% of, of women um, in the U.S. are estimated to have been raped during their lifetimes. Uh, almost 44% of women have experienced other forms of sexual violence, such as sexual co coercion or unwanted sexual content. So, um, so the number grows to 44% if you include not just rape, but also sexual assault, right? Um, other type, which includes other types of sexual violence besides rape. Um, now let's define how that's different from acquaintance rape. So acquaintance rape is sexual assault by a dating partner or someone known to the victim, okay? Um, and that actually is includes uh, the actual rape, the penetration, um, by the, either the dating partner or someone known to the victim. Um, and it's uh, uh, without either without the person's consent. Uh, the person was either forced or they were threatened or the person was incapable of giving consent, okay? So that... that um, is acquaintance rape, okay? It's when the person um, who's doing the assaulting is known uh, by the victim, okay? Uh, acquaintance rape occurs far more often than stranger rape. Um, uh, it's a myth that stranger rape is, uh, is more uh, common. Um, acquaintance rape is much more common, okay? Um, so let's, let's talk more about that. If you think about um, acquaintance rape, um, uh, women also commonly report giving in to unwanted sex because the partner doesn't stop begging, whining, or pleading. And um, women are often less likely to call certain forms of sexual incidents rape. Um, uh, feminists argue that, that using the label rape is important uh, because without it, the incident is not recognized as a crime and, and goes unreported and unpunished. Um, uh, but others point out that a woman's choice of label may be part of how she copes with sexual assault, and she has the right to define her own experience, right? So victims of sexual coercion, um, like victims of other types of violence, suffer psychological consequences in such areas as emotional functioning, social relations, and and problems with their own identity, right? So sexual coercion, um, although it differs from um, from uh, rape, stranger rape, or acquaintance rape, uh, it still has uh, very negative consequences. Okay, let me talk just a little bit more about um, acquaintance rape versus stranger rape before we move on. Um, acquaintance rape can actually be more psychologically damaging than um, stranger rape simply because um, uh, when, you, when it's acquaintance rape, not only is the woman's body violated, but also her trust. When she knows her, her rapist, she's also more likely to blame herself for what happened. So in that way, um, the psychological effects of acquaintance rape can be more severe than stranger rape, okay? Both, both have severe consequences, that's for sure. Something else we, I'd like to talk briefly about is who is more likely to inflict coercive sex, right? Um, to be the, um, the rapist in a um, acquaintance rape. Um, well, there's really no specific way to spot a potential rapist, um, but there are certain factors that could play a role. Um, for instance, um, if someone is coming from an, a violent or abusive family, uh, someone who's been in trouble with the authorities as a teen, um, or, or has been very sexually active at a young age, um, these factors could play a role in um, acquaintance rape 
uh, and being the, the perpetrator of acquaintance rape. Uh, additionally, there's some personality factors, uh, impulsivity, a need to dominate women, low self-esteem, those can all play into it. Also, there's factors in the social environment, uh, involvement in the sports team or fraternity, alcohol use, exposure to pornography, and having friends who encourage sexual conquests and objectification of women. Those are all factors that can play into being the perpetrator of acquaintance rape. Okay, Rape myths also play an important role in coercive sex. Uh, rape myths are these widely held stereotypical beliefs, false beliefs about rape and rape victims. Um, and these, uh, this rape, these rape myths uh, normalize male sexual violence against women, okay? Um, these are crazy ideas like um, that, that all women secretly desire to be raped, that women ask for it, and that women are responsible for rape if they were drunk or dressed provocatively. Those are all examples of rape myths. And these rape myths justify male sexual aggression as natural. They minimize the sexual assault and they encourage the victim blaming, okay? Men tend to endorse rape myths more than women. And men who endorse these rape myths are also more likely to endorse a proclivity to rape, right? Um, so we also see rape myth endorsement associated with higher levels of oppressive and intolerant attitudes, including hostile sexism, racism, homophobia, ageism, classism, conservatism, and right-wing authoritarianism. Um, rape myths may also serve a purpose for, for some women. They provide a sense of control because they su suggest that there are actions that women can take to avoid being raped. Okay. For example, one common rape myth is that women who dress provocatively are asking you to be raped because what a woman wears is up to her. She presumably has the power to choose more conservative clothing and hypothetically reduce her risk of being raped. Unfortunately, although women's endorsement of rape myths might provide a sense of control, there is no evidence that it would actually reduce their risk of being raped. Um, and rape, rape myth acceptance makes it easier to blame women who are raped, okay? So rape myths also have implications for how um, uh, victims of rape feel about themselves and what happened to them. Um, women will blame themselves for the raping incident or justify it by saying that male sexual aggression is natural. Um, so both, unfortunately, both of these... Uh, problems uh, will result in uh, rape being underreported and rape being under um, their consequences for rape uh, not being um, difficult for the perpetrator as they should be. Uh, also interesting to note, um, there are studies that show that um, disabled women uh, report a much higher rate. One study found that 68% of disabled women sampled um, reported at least one instance of abuse, physical, emotional, or sexual within the past year. Okay, a very high number uh, for disabled women. Um, uh, again, they're, the, they're more vulnerable, less able to defend themselves. Um, Another uh, key thing to note is that physical violence um, against a partner is almost always accompanied by psychological abuse. Examples of psychological abuse, um, being threatened, being publicly, publicly humiliated, being criticized by the perpetrator or belittled, right? So that physical abuse, uh, it's, there's going to be psychological abuse that comes with it, okay? Um, Sometimes this is because abusers are, are extremely jealous uh, and they might use accusations against the victim to um, help justify to themselves the physical abuse. They might use accusations of infidelity, etc., to keep um, the victim from seeing friends or going out. Okay, um, so again, these these this this psychological abuse can be. Um, equally as traumatic as the physical abuse, okay? So let's talk about um, uh, specific types of domestic abuse, okay? 
All right, so let's discuss a little bit more about domestic violence. Um, so interestingly enough, um, wife beating can be viewed as morally acceptable in countries, um, in some countries, right? Wife beating is actually acceptable. Um, and these are countries where they have a very strong patriarchal ideology. Um, and it's okay for a husband to beat his wife, um, uh, which we find horrific in the United States um, for the most part. Um, in the U.S., uh, research has been done um, um, both with uh, uh, random sampling surveys and also in studies of women in hospitals and in, in, in our court system and in battered women's shelters. And basically two different types of domestic violence have, have been identified um, in the U.S. One is termed common couples violence, and this is the violence that results when there's a breakdown in a couple's ability to handle a conflict constructively together as a couple. Um, when they can't handle the conflict, sometimes uh, it will cause a breakdown um, and it will cause um, some sort of uh, violence between the couple um, that uh, uh, is most often, obviously, the, the perpetrator is the husband um, and, and uh, the wife is the victim uh, most often. Um, but that's um, one type of domestic violence. Um, this is more um, maybe maybe it happens once. It's not a uh, it's not a, a pattern. Uh, it's it's something that occurs because of a breakdown in the couple's ability to handle a specific conflict um, in a nonviolent constructive way. Right. Um, now there's a second type of domestic violence that is much more of a severe. Uh, pattern of escalating male violence um, and uh, very problematic uh, type of uh, domestic violence. Um, and this is actually termed patriarchal terrorism or intimate terrorism. And again, it's this pattern of severe escalating male violence uh, in which uh, the female victim rarely fights back and almost never agree, uh, initiates aggression. Okay. The motives for this type of um, patriarchal terrorism um, is, uh, again, are, are rooted in patriarchal tradition. Uh, the male perpetrator feels that he owns his wife or his woman is, and is entitled to control her by any, in any means necessary, right? Um, and let's talk more about that. So when we're talking about patriarchal terrorism, this uh, pattern of ever increasing physical violence and, and ongoing um, psychological abuse of, of the victim, um, the, the myth is that there's a quick and easy solution for the, for the woman um, uh, or the victim, which is just to leave. Um, however, that's really a myth because there are many obstacles for women who try to leave abusive relationships. Um, so uh, we'll, we'll talk about that on this slide because the question is that people always ask is, why don't abused women leave? Why don't they just leave? Well, there's all sorts of obstacles. There's many pra practical obstacles to leaving an abusive partner. Uh, the wife may not have any money. Um, he may have been, it may have been such a controlling relationship that the husband curtailed her relationships with others. She may not have a safe place to go. She may not have a car to leave in. Um, there may be issues regarding the children um, and their lives and their custody. Um, and interestingly, uh, Research shows the, that a woman in this type of very severe patriarchal terrorism relationship is more likely to be um, actually physically injured or killed by her partner um, after she leaves than when they are living together. So this is um, so this is this strange phenomenon that attempting to leave may actually increase the violence. Okay. So according to the Bureau of Justice Statistics, in 2010, 
39% of all female murder victims were killed by for, former or current partners, right? So, um, so, so the actual, the actual trying to leave the relationship may actually re, uh, result in greater injury or either, or even murder of the partner who, who's trying to leave the relationship, the, the battered partner. Um, and again, uh, something else we haven't talked about yet is is sort of another reason why the woman just doesn't leave is much of the partner's abuse is cyclical. So the partner goes through um, a period of increasing tension. Uh, then there's a violent episode against the victim. And then there's a long or um, perhaps a longer loving phase. So it's these these three phases that are cyclical that keep repeating. So this building tension and then the um, the violent episode and then the loving phase that follows it. OK, so this creates what's what what is termed the battered women's syndrome. OK, and this is a type of post-traumatic stress disorder in which a woman may become incapable of taking action on her own behalf. She may actually become incapable of leaving the situation because she is so um, because she is so uh, demoralized psychologically and physically um, that she becomes becomes un, unable to leave. Okay, so that's another obstacle um, and another reason why um, believing that a woman can just walk away um, is mythical. So, um, so what happens to a lot of these women? Well. Thank goodness, a, a large majority of women in these long-term re abusive relationships do eventually manage to end the, uh, the relationship and leave the abusive partner. However, leaving is a very long process, typically. Um, and uh, research has shown that women uh, who stay in the relationships until they have the emotional and financial resources to leave and, and stay gone um, experience less violence than those who leave and have to return repeatedly to the relationship. So when the woman, once the woman has established um, outside, re outside resources and has the emotional and financial stability to leave and stay away, they are much less likely um, to, um, to um, experience additional violence, um, which they would have if they keep having to go back to the relationship, right? So how, how do we as a society end this type of relational violence? Well, as long as uh, society accepts men's, men's right uh, to, do, to dominate women and women's second-class status, the violence in heterosexual relationships is inevitable. According This is according to Bograd in 1988. Um, there have been some... Um, some movements which have had some success. There's something called the Battered Women's Movement, and this is an international movement educating the public about domestic violence, um, helping to pass uh, laws, to reform legal systems to protect women, and to provide direct aid to women with violent partners. Okay, this is called the Battered Women's Movement. Okay, we also see um, since the 1970s a, a lot of battered women's shelters have. Uh, have opened. We still don't have enough battered women's shelters. There are uh, many shelters still have to turn women away. Um, but where the shelters do exist, uh, the women can find safety, they can find emotional support, they can find information about their legal rights, and sometimes there's counseling available. Okay. The battered woman's movement has resulted in laws against battering and marital rape in all 50 states in the U.S. Okay. Um, uh, uh, and, um, uh, it's interesting to note that we don't see this type of, uh, um, movement towards protection of women, um, across the globe. For instance, in Russia, President Putin has signed into law recently a law that decriminalizes some forms of do domestic violence. Um, basically, this law says that the first incidence per year of domestic violence that doesn't cause substantial bodily harm is no longer a criminal offense, okay? So this is despite Russian news agencies that claim that 35,000 women a day are beaten 
and the 26,000 children a day are beaten by their parents and that 12,000 women die each year from domestic violence. So um, even though we've seen great progress in the U.S. in terms of battered women's movement and battered women's shelters, that's not necessarily true in all parts of the globe, right? So if we think in terms of ways uh, that we can um, impact uh, violence, intimate partner violence, um, we see that feminism and feminist initiatives um, to prevent dating violence and prevent acquaintance rape um, is often uh, to put the focus more on the perpetrators as opposed to on the victims, because studies suggest that programs run by men for men are more effective in terms of changing men's behavior. Um, research on perpetrators um, in domestic abuse is difficult, right? Um, because more abusive men, uh, most abusive men, deny and minimize, minimize their violence and they blame their wives or their girlfriends for it, okay? They don't necessarily usually volunteer to participate in programs um, aimed at changing them and many of them drop out who do choose programs to, um, to help them. Research suggests that arresting and convicting um, uh, domestic abusers effectively def deters them um, and that's because that shows that the abuse is wrong that uh, the laws prevent it and when um, it's no longer uh, considered the norm for it to be appropriate or um, or, or for men to be able to um, uh, not have consequences um, so abuse of women in relationships is a complex problem uh, so there's interventions needed on many fronts. So not only do we have to address changing patriarchal social structures in our societies, we also have to uh, help the victims and we have to have laws in place to stop the perpetrators, right? To change those norms of the acceptability of domestic violence, okay? So now let's turn our attention to violence that occurs to women later in life. So we think when we um, look at the research on violence in later life for women, um, this abuse uh, can take many forms. It's often termed elder abuse. So what is elder abuse? Elder abuse is violence against the elderly uh, that involves physical abuse, emotional or psychological abuse, may involve sexual abuse, uh, neglect, uh, it may also involve misappropriating the victim's possessions or their money, okay? Elder abuse is more often borne by women, and old people are reluctant to complain about abuse as it could mean losing their homes. So often elder abuse goes um, is underreported and underaddressed, okay? Elder abuse reflects patriarchal power imbalances. What does that mean? Um, it's when... Um, the older women are vulnerable um, because they don't have any power uh, and they don't have any status often in family situations. They're considered a burden um, and uh, they um, are very isolated um, and it takes place within families, within homes, so it's not usually talked about outside of the home. It may be a dark secret of the home and oftentimes the, um, the victim herself um, is wants to protect the people who are, um, who are abusing her because they're family members and she doesn't want to send them to jail. In fact, the incidences of elder abuse are likely to continue to increase um, in the United States as the percentage of people over the age of 65 increase in the population. Um, Older women can face violence at the hands of husbands or boyfriends. And like I said, they're not likely to report the ab abuse because they're going to want to protect these family members. Um, sometimes uh, the, um, the older generation um, has more pro prohibitive views of a divorce as well. So they don't think that's an option. Um, and they'll encourage secrecy um, to uh, protect 
uh, the abusive family member. Um, sexual abuse is sometimes a problem as well. And this can be not just by husbands or um, boyfriends, but also by um, younger family members, uh, sons, etc. cetera. Um, uh, so we, if we think in terms of solutions for ending elder abuse, um, uh, to reduce and eliminate elder abuse, um, some researchers have suggested um, healthcare professionals um, need to watch for um, uh, signs of elder abuse with older adults, okay, and be educated on the risk factors. Um, assessments are needed to figure out if someone is being victimized. Um, also, collaboration between community providers. Um, appears to be one way to increase the quantity and quality of services for those experiencing uh, abuse in developing countries. Um, in Pennsylvania, uh, here's an example that's here in the United States. Um, the Pennsylvania Elder Sexual Abuse Project conducted um, was conducted in order to encourage the collaboration of ripe crisis centers and adult protective services to better address the issue of elder sexual abuse, right? So that's now um, becoming more known and understood. Uh, it's been taboo for so long to, to talk about uh, elder sexual abuse. Uh, this is another issue that feminists um, have been successful in bringing to light. So there is a lot of needs need for a multifaceted approach to interventions um, in terms of eliminating violence against women. Um, so these these have to occur at the individual level of the gender system, right? They also need to be um, uh, at the at the um, interpersonal level and also at the societal level, right? So schools and colleges trying to educate girls and women in ways they can avoid being assaulted, um, uh, which is not always super helpful, um, but at least it's a start. Um, children are taught as well to, um, to be vigilant in case anyone ever touches them inappropriately. Again, this is again placing the responsibility on a child, which is difficult at best for the child to manage. Um, uh, these self-protective strategies can be useful, but can also be uh, problematic, right? So we do see that colleges and universities in the U.S. are beginning to implement rape prevention programs that are primarily directed at men and women separately, which is important. Um, uh, at the sociocultural level, movements such as battered women's movement help address the structural barriers to ending violence against women, right? Um, we know that we now have battered with laws against battering in all 50 states, okay? So in general, um, women's rights are human rights, right? So um, this violence against women occurs in every country. It's one of the most widespread human rights violations in the world. Um, but we know that gender-based violence can be ended by encouraging women's economic empowerment, for one thing. Um, we see so much that strong correlation uh, between women's status and violence against women. The lower their status, the more likely they are to, they are to experience violence. So if we can raise their status by economic empowerment, that will also reduce the violence against them. And continuing to uh, challenge existing views of uh, gender power and, and inequality needs to happen as well. So these are ways to make a difference.